All right, I'll try it. Juggling notes and controllers. Hi, everyone. This is so awesome. So it's uh, it's so awesome to see how many people are here and how many people I have met over the past six months. Uh, my wife and I moved here um, late July. And, uh, also jobless, moving to Portland seemed like a good idea to us. Um, and I spent six months just hanging out and having coffee with a lot of you. So it's awesome that so many of you are here. So uh, I'm going to try to burn through this uh, at a, at a rapid pace, so we're not all glazing over too much. But first, so I, I've done this presentation, I actually done it with Kent um, when I first got here. We did it like, what was that, August probably? Um, so I first did this presentation, and it's been since updated and changed a little bit, um, but I have to share this first part. I keep forgetting I can see my own slides this way. Um, so I did this at an agency called Instrument. I'm a huge fan of graphic design and design. And I felt a lot of pressure of presenting this at a at a one of the top end agencies in town, and so I put a lot of effort into designing slides, and I was feeling really good. And I was looking at that title slide that you're seeing right now, and I was like, something seems familiar about this, and I couldn't put my finger on it. And then I realized I had actually accidentally made a textbook. Um, so <laughs> it's, and this will probably be a textbook someday. I hope. So it's, it was like, yeah, it's the typical, I swear it's not a stock photo, but I didn't take it either. But um, I just was like, oh, God, how embarrassing. So I, then I went for it, put the McGraw-Hill thing on it and everything. <laughs> so quick about me, um, originally from South Carolina, from the South, um, got into the video game industry, uh, moved to Chicago, San Diego, Seattle, um, got tired of the video game industry because of all that moving. Uh, and wound up back in South Carolina for a little while. Um, most of that was doing a lot of 3D software development uh, on, on the engineering side. Uh, and then around uh, 2007 or so, I got uh, into uh, augmented reality, right when the first iPhone came out and was sort of barely doing it. Um, but other than that, I've done all kinds of other stuff. Uh, take me to coffee. I'll tell you about my used car lot and my pet shop I had and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so I wanted to quick dive into some terminology because um, it's it's so funny. Somebody just tweeted me today about this. There's so much uh, debate in our tiny little bubble about these terms, and it's really funny to me. Um, like, wh why do we why do we care? The the technological differences are important though for now, uh, but I really believe that eventually these will these will become uh, not that important to know. Some of catch up on my notes here. Okay, so let's talk about VR, because we're at the VR meetup. Um, so right now, this is kind of your spectrum of devices. Uh, you've got your, all the way from your low end, kind of cardboard here, all the way up, Rift, Vive, PlayStation VR. Um, we kind of make a little uh, discerning uh, mark here, just kind of, we kind of collectively call this mobile VR, uh, generally powered by mobile phones. This is generally powered by more powerful computers. Um, but the key takeaway is VR just fully overtakes your field of view and your, usually your hearing. Um, and it is the most accessible version of all these technologies we'll talk about right now. Um, the advantages of it is fully immersive. If you haven't done any demos here tonight, please do. Um, the content development is doing a, using video game tech, which is why it's great for me. Um, and the performance has gotten to a really great point. Uh, to where we don't really have issues with Cygnus like we had even just a year ago. Um, so this is the type of uh, experiences you'll have. You see this, this is a video feed of the guy playing the game. This game's called Space Pirate Trainer. And you can just see how active and into it he is. So uh, we have people over at the house and we give them demos and we usually put them in Space Pirate Trainer and then I have to wipe the sweat off of everything. Um, it's a very physical thing. I think that's another interesting thing to point out about VR is that it, it, ha it is pulling people out of their, uh, kind of the, out of the chairs and the couches. Um, there was a news story not too long ago about the guy that lost 50 pounds or so, Kent, yeah. somebody. Um, I can't remember what he was playing. And like, Kent plays Audio Shield every day, right, for exercise. So I, I think it's totally valid. Um, and then you've got non-gaming stuff. So I like to point out there's all kinds of interactive things you can do. This one's called Pearl. Um, it's actually a, a sweet little story about a man and his daughter, and you sit in the passenger seat and kind of watch this linear story unfold, but you can look around freely. It's really fun. Um, so we're going to jump into the AR. That was the VR part of the acronym soup. 
Um, to me, I call it AR. Some of you may want to debate and argue about that. Um, I'm a convert. I used to not call some of these things AR, but I'm uh, sticking to my guns now. So what's different about this is you'll notice these are all optically see-through. So they're not overtaking your vision. You can see the real world while you see virtual content layered in. So the type of experiences this enables is uh, this is more, this is the type of AR I got into um, early on, um, which is kind of using this digital view through window. I also like to point out uh, what this is, is uh, not always is augmented reality, in my opinion, a wearable. So it's about layering information in, it's about adding a virtual digital uh, contextual thing to the world. And then of course, uh, this is the most mainstream example of AR. So hope, hopefully most of you know about uh, Pokemon uh, Go. Um, it really brought the terminology to the forefront. Um, still debatable with a lot of people about that. And then the, the one everybody bats around, mixed reality, MR. And this one's always fun to explain. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my version. And I'm going with the 1995 version. So this is on Wikipedia. If you look on Wikipedia at mixed reality, um, where mixed reality is actually a continuum and all of these other acronyms are subsets. And if you think of this like a slider between how much you see the real world, which is a little bit more on the augmented side versus how much you're completely immersed, that's the best way to think about it. Unfortunately, there's, the reason there's confusion is because the modern VR industry has also adopted the term for this type of video format. So this is just video right here. They've recorded the, I feel like a weatherman with all this stuff going. <laughs> um, they recorded the, the human playing, playing in the world while at the same time recording a, a, a perspective in the virtual world and then they composite the video together. So everything about this video is virtual except for the man in it and the controllers he's holding and the headset he's wearing. And unfortunately, it, it was a great boost to the VR industry about 18 months ago, maybe a little longer, because it finally allowed us to show what people experience when they're wearing these things. Um, unfortunately, they kind of adopted the term mixed reality, which just confuses things even more. So what do I know? Um, so in two, 2014, um, I saw the future, uh, shockingly, in Florida. Um, so there's a company there called Magic Leap. Um, I, I'd imagine most people here have heard of it, but uh, they're an augmented reality hardware platform company. This was their first office, not this whole building, like literally this one little thing here was their office. Uh, they've since moved on to much bigger, bigger digs. Um, but uh, in this office, literally in this office is where I finally got a glimpse of what I think is coming. What did I see? Uh, it was kind of like this. It was not this. Uh, this is a much newer version. Um, we called it the bench top or the beast. Um, you know, very rigidly mounted, clearly not a wearable. Um, but what I saw there through that really old device uh, changed how I thought about reality. So what did I see? So I can't unfortunately show you what I saw, um, but I, I'll try to quickly describe it. Uh, it was a demo I was working on. I joined the company and we were building the demo content, and the demo was, you're looking through this thing, keep in mind you're seated, rigidly mounted, you're like getting an eye exam. And there was a little, fat little dragon, this tall, back of the room, and would fly towards you, and you'd hold out your finger, and it would just kind of hover to a little perch and stop. So the first time I did that, we were testing this like 11 o'clock at night in this office park, and the first time it all worked, I just uncontrollably laughed. It was the only thing I could do. I just hysterically laughed. And I was the guy that like wrote the code for it. I knew exactly what was going on. But for whatever reason, it was just like this childlike response. Like it was just completely uncontrollable. And it, that's really when I started thinking about why, why, what was that? I mean, I knew exactly what's going on technically. And it was because I felt something and it was because I felt that dragon land on my finger, but when it didn't actually land on my finger, my only response was this hysterical laugh. But that's when I realized that's why this is different. That's why this technology is so interesting to me. And I want to dive into that a little bit more. Um, and, and another thing we talked about uh, in our original presentation was presence. And so that was a big part of it. Um, so I'm going to take a step back and talk about my theory on reality or a theory on reality and what is happening in this moment that we accept this as our reality. Well, we're here, 
we have a lot of incoming signals, a lot of stimuli, um, and I call that uh, presence as a part of that. So we won't we won't go into proprioception, but that's basically your sense of your own body. It's how we can touch our heel without looking at it. It's how we know we are uh, where we are relative to the physical world. Uh, the exteroception part is all these external signals coming in. So just think about them as sound, physical forces, all this feedback we get from the world uh, coming into our mind uh, through all of our different systems. So if you start to think about your mind is this kind of model-making engine, and you're constantly receiving all these signals. Uh, you know, our vestibular system is giving us our sense of direction and movement. Uh, touch, oral, and visual systems are giving us additional details that we don't know until we touch or look fixate on something. We're constantly scanning our reality around us and updating our mental model. Um, there's all kinds of cool uh, checks you can like think about when you try to remember a, a dream or you remember a memory you don't really have a clear realistic memory of that you kind of have this muddied version and it's hard to stay held on to the details of that because you don't have the real physical world to kind of check that in so usually when we're looking around the world we're in this relaxed state when the things don't add up you kind of get skeptical even if you don't realize it sorry jiggle my notes here Um, so to me, true mixed reality happens when these digital signals that we're creating with our, you know, with, with headphones and optics um, pass the natural perception system. And for me, vision is one of the most powerful inputs that we've not really explored yet, or we are starting to explore it. Um, so, you know, think about these signals are coming in as light. Uh, they're transmitting via the optic nerve into the visual cortex, and the visual cortex is where we do this mental modeling of our reality. So how do we tap into that? How do we, you know, exploit this, this, this ability? So the first thing we have to do is get a really powerful computer and tap it into, has anybody heard the term wetware? Um, so first we need to tap in. I'm totally just kidding. We're not doing that. No. It turns, out, it turns out your eyeballs are wired into your optic nerve and your visual cortex pretty well already. Don't really need to mess with that. We don't need the matrix style head jacks. But let's talk about the eye real quick. Um, so in the, in the analog world, our physical world, we're bombarded by photons. These monitors are spraying an unbelievable amount of photons all over us. You can't feel it. Um, and like we're constantly being, so we, we can't possibly process all those photons. Our visual cortex has to be the size of a tree trunk to do that. So we're constantly filtering and scanning. But when that light does come into our eye, um, it's safe to consider that a signal that's encoded with things like color, brightness, and distance. So when we do fixate on something, we're reading in all that information in the form of a, of a photon. This is a quote that kind of validates the theory a little bit. So if you think about it, we're just constantly scanning um, and constantly updating this model and it's fading away and we're keeping it updated. And when we want to fixate on something, we have to make a conscious effort to it. I think I'm going to skip go straight to this slide. So I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but um, you'll hear a lot of talk about um, what's called vergence accommodation mismatch. And what all it is is that when we do decide to focus on something, I'm gonna pick something up here. When we focus on it, our eyes toe in and they verge on that point. And then once we get locked in, our eyes change shape to focus the light coming from that point. So keep in mind, I said there was a depth cue in that focal distance. So naturally, those two things are always linked together. We always verge, and then we try to accommodate on a point um, at a certain distance, especially if it's like within the close range, like less than 20 feet, it's really strong. So the problem comes in with some of the older displays is we're giving you a stereo cue that makes you think, oh, something's like one meter away. And then your, so your eyes verge in to fuse that together. And then when your eyes go to focus on that light coming from one meter away, the light's actually coming from a screen that's here. And it's, it doesn't have that focal depth encoded. 
Now, people make a big deal about this conflict um, and about this difference. Um, I think it, the only reason I even bring it up, I don't, I don't think it's. Uh, I, I love VR, and I don't, I, you know, I think the accommodations for just mismatch was a little overhyped. But I do think there are things when we go back to this idea that we're starting to hack the perception system. We do need to consider that accommodation cue because I think that's part of the magic of what we what we see on some of these newer displays. And back to that idea that if we're processing the real world normally and we're looking around and then we all of a sudden get this thing that doesn't match, your mind kind of switches out of its normal, natural, relaxed state. Um, and that's just backing up, backing up this. And it, so back to the little dragon idea. I mean, that was I had a non, I had a, I had a, a non-visual reaction to a visual stimuli, uh, and I think it was because of all those things checking out. So, keeping in mind, we now have the ability to digitally render photons and put them in your eyes, and they're almost imperceptible from the real world. Uh, with just that ability alone, it's not enough, right? Uh, there's there's some other things we need to do. So the display tech is only one part of it. Another key critical factor is computer vision and basically uh, the computing environment understanding the physical world. So this is just a real quick example. Um, I usually go in a little more detail on it, but just the general idea that that here's your image, your real world image on the left. Maybe that's coming through a camera feed. <laughs> And the computer vision algorithm has detected that there is a bed and a chair there. And you'll notice that it's not actually even the correct style of bed and chair, but by virtue of the fact that it detected that those were those items and in the proper orientation. And now you go back to the idea that we can render these virtual things anywhere we want, and we could put a virtual character on the bed or on the desk. So uh, we need that contextual awareness to really put all this stuff together. So, and this is a huge part of it. Uh, and it's not only about what they call like reconstruction and object detection. This is how you do the inside out tracking um, and sensor, you know, all these, all this great new tech that's coming that makes it possible to walk around in a real physical environment and have the computing system actually know what's going on. So those things combined are really powerful. And uh, another interesting part of all this new technology is we're really pushing the boundaries of input. So, uh, this is your standard Vive controller. It's a full six degree of freedom. It's extremely intuitive. You can hand anyone a controller and they will and tell them they can draw with it. Everybody knows what to do with it. Um, it's, it's crazy that we have such high technology that's been developed in the past two or three years to make something as simple as drawing in the air intuitive, um, but it is really great. Uh, there's more things coming. Eye tracking is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Unfortunately, most of these companies are getting acquired as quickly as they're getting spun up. Um, and that should tell you something about uh, all the ways that we, the, all the things we can do. So keep in mind, going back to the examples of if I know where you're looking and you're verging, I can put content in the appropriate place. This could be an input mechanic where you look at things and select things. Um, I've seen really great eye tracking. It's really compelling. Um, voice is getting a lot of attention right now, and that's only going to help us. Uh, this whole, you know, voice UI concept of Google Home and Alexa, um, you know, these these technologies have really come a long way in just a short period of time, and they all factor into this whole mixed reality idea. And then this final example is just straight up bare hands. Now you can't see the bare hands in this this animation, but um, that's being detected completely barehanded by a sensor called the Leap Motion, not to be confused with Magic Leap, um, and it allows you to just completely grab and touch things uh, without any external tracking, which except for the sensor. So when you start to combine all these things, uh, you start to realize that we're going to be able to start doing some really crazy stuff. We're going to be able to do things um, in the real world environment, especially with the the AR tech um, as you're walking around, um, people are going to start having difficulty keeping those separated. So I'm going to get a little dystopian for just a minute. Just a minute. Does anybody know what this is from? I know a bunch of people do. Yeah. Yes. This is a, so there's a video. It's called Hyper Reality, hyper uh, hyphen reality.co. It's about a woman who is wearing some sort of device you don't know what. And this is her in the grocery store. And it's, you can see like 
the trade-off here. You've got the fun dog on the shopping cart and it's so cute, but it's also telling me I should really buy these coconuts that are on sale because I'll earn 20 extra points and whatever crazy game it is I'm playing at the moment. Uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of augmented things going on here. Um, and it's trade-offs, right? There's also the shopping list, which is great, right? That's super handy. I've got this virtual shopping list. Um, but there's also this attention to detail pay, pay, played around how many level, you know, what I'm level 99 and how many points I have. Something to keep in mind. And so here's an animation just to show it in action a little bit more. And at this point in the film, uh, uh, her headset's breaking down because someone's actually hacked into it, which is a whole other presentation. Um, but the reason why I like to show this is because this is not sci-fi future stuff. This is all highly possible right now today. I've seen examples of all this stuff firsthand, um, and it, it's it's coming. Um, so, and it's you know if you're if you're an optimistic futurist uh, like we all probably are, it seems really awesome. Um, but there's a downside to all that power. I also like to mention about this film is it was executive produced by a company called Bully Entertainment that actually makes interactive experiences. So the, the whole premise of this short uh, film is rooted in a lot of practical knowledge. So how do we maybe avoid the bad parts of this? So uh, John Rousseau, he works, uh, he's a partner at a, at a design agency in Seattle called Artifact. Um, we worked a lot with those guys. Uh, when I was at Magic Leave, and they've done a ton of VR stuff, so they know what they're talking about. And he published this several months ago, and it's just kind of these guidelines. I'm not going to I'm not going to read them to you, but um, you know you can kind of get the get the gist that we need to be mindful um, as designers, developers, and supporters of this technology. We vote with our decisions and our dollars in these formative stages. So if you're a content creator, and you are so hyped because you got this client gig to make this VR thing. Um, I know that's exciting, but maybe make sure that the VR thing that you're making is is moving towards the world we all want to live in. Sa on that same on that same note, as we are enthusiasts and supporters of this technology, uh, if you see if you see people doing positive good things, pay for it and help them and support them. Spread the word. Tell them it's awesome. I can tell you, um, you know, the VR community is so, is so diverse, and there's so many awesome positive uh, experiences out there uh, that we should support, if that's the world we want to live in. Maybe not. Maybe we want to live in a dystopian world. If you do, support that. I don't know. Um, it's, that's the freedom. Uh, so, you know, at this point, you're like, especially if you, you're already kind of a, a creative type or a creator type, it's like, oh, that sounds awesome, but how do I actually use any of this stuff? Um, and so, I, I, you know, I got mostly bad news right now. It's uh, it's still early days. I mean, all this stuff is evolving at a rapid rate. Um, I think I'm a little shocked at how long we've been with the current Vive and Rift. Um, I'm not surprised that HoloLens announced that they're going to delay till 2019 on their next version. Um, things are moving both extremely rapidly, but n not as rapidly as maybe some of us would like, especially on the content and software side of things. Um, so I would just suggest that you start to mentally get in the headspace. Think about these challenges around uh, where, is, where are we headed as a society with this technology. Um, the good news is the, the fields are green and the opportunities are vast. Things are changing so quickly, though. Um, it's better to become a more of a, to steep yourself in the theory of where we're headed as opposed to trying to, you know, constantly try to ship an app at all times. Because you're not, uh, you know, the other... The other part of it is, is that, you know, truthfully, um, especially uh, like us, us in the startup world, like uh, when we were talking to investors and those types, like we don't really expect this to hit a uh, really critical mass mainstream for a, a couple years uh, out. So you got plenty of time. So just take your time, experiment, get involved, um, you know, try the latest and greatest tech any chance you get, uh, meetups and conventions, uh, you know, this meetup is great because we've got demos going on. Check it out. Just stand in line if you have to. Um, we'll, the biggest challenge is us getting enough hardware for people to play around with it. Um, so go to those. Um, I want to drop a few thoughts around, you know, think about the fact that, sure, I could tell this amazing immersive story, but remember, you don't know what room 
your users are playing in or what they can see at any given time. You no longer control the frame like we, we traditionally have done with video games and film. So think about that. Think about, uh, I've seen so many bad experiences where people just assumed that the viewer was always gonna look in this direction. And meanwhile, when you put anyone in a headset, the first thing they do is like wander around. So you've got to design around that. You, you can, there, and, and we are start as a community, we're starting to develop patterns and like best practices around how to like guide the user. And that's the type of stuff I think you should be diving into right now. So specifically to, to AR, because not, there's not a lot of information about AR out there right now. Um, my guidance has always been, think about magical moments. Don't try to paint the floor of this room with lava. Instead, like have little puddles of lava around. Um, it's just, it's a function of the field of view of these optical view through devices. They're just, you're not gonna get the immersion that, just yet. Um, and it's just better spent on these magical moments. Don't try to bombard the user, you know, Times Square style with stuff. Um, and then if you're thinking about a magical world, if you do wanna put someone in an enchanted forest, VR is probably your best bet for now. So, this is, um, so this is my example of a magical moment. So this was a Magic Leap uh, concept video that went out, oh God, probably almost two and a half years ago now. Um, this is Kiki the Elephant. I think I've got the animation here. So here's the animation. Um, the concept is real world person standing uh, in a beautiful flower field actually, and uh, unfolds her hands, little virtual elephant appears and floats up. Um, this is not recorded through the Magic Leap hardware, but we did build this demo. Um, but this was just before we had the ability to record. So to me, that's a magic moment. Funny story about the elephant. Um, so in the early days when we came out with, uh, with, that, with that video, you know, especially the people inside at Magic Leap, we were constantly uh, scouring the internet for anything people were talking about. And, um, Good old Reddit. Reddit, Reddit made us a, made a funny little joke about us. We thought it was funny. So, um, you know, let me break break a little bad news. It's really not that bad news. Um, this hardware is changing so rapidly. Um, the current tools and workflows are coming from the video game industry. If you don't have a video game background, um, the learning curve can be steep dealing with 3D assets, tools, uh, making builds, juggling SDKs, it's a bit of a mess. Um, and so it's gonna be steep. So if you really have your heart set on being a creator, um, especially if you live in Portland, uh, there are things like Oregon Storyboard. Where'd those guys go? There they are. Uh, Oregon Storyboard, you know, they're, they're, we can take classes here and uh, it's awesome that we have a, such an open community. Um, you know, I think probably, where's Joshua? Um, I think probably evolving out of this will be a developer uh, oriented thing, I would think eventually. Yeah. You... There you go. Yeah, so Pig, Pig Squad is, uh, is the independent game developer group. Um, tons of guys know Unity in that group. They're, they almost exclusively use it. Um, you know, it, so if, there's plenty of resources here to con get connected with. The good news. I think the tools are gonna to evolve to be more intuitive and accessible, and that's exactly what I'm working on at Torch. Um, we want to get rid of that steep learning curve. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna to plug it too much, but I don't think we're the only ones doing this. So the good news is I think over time, when there is a large critical mass audience of people with VR and AR hardware, I think you won't have to go through as much pain to create on these platforms as we do now. And it's gotten way better even in just the past three years. So in closing, to me, thoughtful design always wins over novelty. It's awesome that you can do some of this crazy stuff uh, on these VR headsets, but um, a, a lot of the content right now is very demo and short, shallow, for lack of a better word. Um, and I think I think the things like uh, the Pearl thing we talked about earlier, things where people really are telling a story and taking advantage of the medium, um, those will survive the test of time. Um, I like to throw this out, like when you are concepting these ideas or working on these ideas, just because something's in VR does not make it better. Uh, my friend Alicia, uh, who who has presented here, uh, here before, 
you know, she was like, we had this whole conversation at Magic Leap where somebody wanted to have spreadsheets in your eyeballs, and we we're like, why do you want a spreadsheet in your eyeballs? And they're like, but it's cool, and we're like, no, it's not. So, just uh, you know, uh, just just take a moment and say, is this actually better? It, because it's on this new platform doesn't mean it's better. And back to kind of the other um, thoughts earlier, you know, are we building the world that I want to live in? Uh, you know, this is our opportunity. We've seen how web and mobile have gone the way of the attention economy. There's a reason why Google wants to build autonomous cars. It's not because they want you to not drive. They want you to be on the internet some more uh, while you're in your car. So we're already kind of in that world. And right now we, you know, I love the VR community because it is very grassroots um, and it's very collaborative. Um, and this is kind of our opportunity to kind of stake a claim around no, we don't want that kind of stuff in our world, or we're not going to support it. You can build it if you want. Maybe a few people will support it, but most of us want to support the more positive stuff. But more importantly, you know, let's all just help each other make cool stuff. I think that's a, this is a great forum for that. There's tons of local meetups, lots of groups. Um, you know, I'm available. Uh, feel free to to hit me up on Twitter, uh, and I'm I'm happy to kind of connect people as I can. Uh, and that's all I got. <laughs>